Being able to accurately calculate intrinsic value is a fundamental tool in the toolbox of any good investor. Are you fundamentally buying something for less than it's worth and getting a really good deal? Or are you overpaying for the cash flows that that business is likely to produce out into the future? If you can have a good handle on that, then you can also have a good handle on exactly what sort of return you're likely to make from any given stock. And you have also a very good handle on how much risk you're taking. Are you overpaying for that business and expecting really, really good results to, to allow you to make a good return? Or are you able to make a good return even if the business doesn't produce quite the cash flows that you first expected because you are able to buy it for such an undervalued price? Calculating intrinsic value is both part art and part science. We're going to have to make some estimates and end up with some ballpark figures of where we think intrinsic value lands. And our goal is to be approximately right rather than precisely wrong. Uh, with anything in maths, you can calculate these things out to multiple decimal places, but that really doesn't matter. We want to use conservative assumptions, come up with a ballpark range of what we think a business is worth, and then go from there. It doesn't matter if you think a business is worth $150 a share and your friend thinks it's worth $170 a share. If the thing's trading at $300, it's going to be a pass. You're not going to buy that. But if it's trading at $100 or $80, that's something you're going to want to dig into much, much closer. So that's what we're trying to achieve with calculating intrinsic value. We're not looking for something that's worth 100 and trying to buy it for 98. We're trying to get a big gap between what we think something's worth and what we can buy it for, a big margin of safety. It increases our return, it reduces our risk, um, and that is a phenomenal combination for your returns long term. So uh, let's get into the method. This is actually a method that I picked up from a book called The Dundo Investor by Monish Pabrai. And it's a method that I've been using for uh, a little over a year now. So if you've seen my previous valuation videos, my philosophy has changed slightly since then. Um, but without further ado, let's get into calculating intrinsic value. We're going to use Apple stock just like we did in a previous video. I will also leave a template to download this uh, calculator in the description below. So I hope you enjoyed the video, but for now, let's get into that. So Monish Pabrai's method of valuing a stock, which we're going to use today, is just a simple discounted cash flow. And we're actually going to walk through two versions of it, one which I have sort of modified to make it my own, and I'll show you why I did that uh, with Ford Motor Company stock later in the video. So definitely hang around for that one. It's very, very important, particularly if you're valuing companies that have debt. So uh, with that said, let's start off with Apple. So essentially a discounted cash flow is uh, attempting to answer quite a simple question. So when you purchase a business, assuming that that business makes money, that business is going to return cash flow to you every single year. And then at some point, if you choose to sell that business, you're going to get cash after that transaction. So if someone offered you $10 today, or $10 in 10 years, you'd probably take the $10 today every day of the week. Um, if someone offered you $10 today or $100 in 10 years, and those are sort of your two options, uh, you may still take the $10, you may ha wait for 10 years and take 100, it's kind of up in the air with that one. But if someone offered you $10 today or $100 million in 10 years, if you wait, uh, you would take the $100 million uh, every day of the week. You would definitely wait that 10 years. So that's essentially the calculation that a discounted cash flow is trying to go through. It's saying if I'm going to get a certain amount of cash back in the future, how much is it intelligent for me to lay out today in order to get a good return? So in order to run this valuation, you're going to need a few different pieces of information. The first key bit of info is how fast do you expect Apple to grow out into the future? So in this case, we're doing a valuation over a 10 year period of time. You can really choose whichever period of time you would like, um, assuming it's not something less than a year and something very short term. Uh, you can essentially choose whichever period of time you like. Um, so in this case, we've gone for 10 years and we need to make an estimate of how quickly we think Apple will grow over the next one to five years and then over the next six to 10, over years six to 10. So uh, there's several ways to approach this. I'm gonna keep it simple and look on Yahoo Finance for what the uh, estimates are from analysts currently. So if I click over to Yahoo Finance, search Apple and then click into analysis. 
I can scroll down to the bottom and see that the forecast for the next five years per annum, we're expected to, for Apple to grow at about 12% per year. So I'll come back and I'll enter 12% for our growth rate for years one to five. And I'm gonna be fairly conservative and drop it down to 7% for years six to 10. The next input here is our discount rate. Uh, this is simply the rate of return that you would like to make over this period of time on this investment. Um, and I'm using 10% uh, simply because that's the rate that Pabrai used in his book. So um, you can use whichever rate you like, the higher you put the discount rate, the lower the intrinsic value is going to be. Um, in other words, if you're going to have to get the business cheaper in, term, in order to make a higher return, and vice versa, if you make the discount rate lower, you can afford to pay more upfront for the business and you'll get a lower return. The next input we have is the multiple for our terminal value. So uh, terminal value is simply what we can sell the business for at the end of this investment period. And there are several very fancy ways to calculate this that they will teach you in business school. Uh, for today, we're gonna keep it simple. And I'm gonna use, again, Monash Pabrai's guidelines of anywhere from 10 to 15 times free cash flow. 15 times for very high quality businesses, which Apple certainly is, so I'm gonna choose that one today and 10 times for a lower quality business. So um, be your own judge on that one in terms of what multiple you use, um, but I'm just gonna keep it simple for today and use 15 times free cash flow. So the next input we need is the year one or current free cash flows for Apple. Um, this is relatively simple to find by a quick Google search. So if you Google Apple free cash flow, uh, I'm going to click on macro trends because that always has fairly good data. And if you can't find a free cash flow number for a business, uh, it's easy enough to look out to look up or calculate from the annual report. So um, free cash flow is simply any operating cash flow minus any capital expenditures. So um, use that simple formula and then you'll come up with free cash flow. But from Guru Focus, I'm getting a current free cash flow from Apple of 59.896 billion. So I'm gonna come across and pop that in as the free cash flow. Uh, you'll see our discounted cash flow is now starting to populate some numbers. And the final thing that we need is excess capital or how much cash does Apple have uh, currently on their books. So again, this can be found in Yahoo Finance. So if you go over to Yahoo Finance and Statistics, I find is the easiest place to find this. And then if we scroll down to balance sheet, we'll find that Apple currently has $107.16 billion in cash uh, currently within the company. So I'm going to pop that in our inputs as well. And now we have our discounted cash flow populated. So we essentially have 11 forms of cash flow over these 10 years. So the first 10 are simply our free cash flow production from the business, and this is growing over time because of our growth rates. And in the 10th year, we're estimating that we can sell the business at 15 times free cash flow. So uh, this has been discounted back over various uh, time periods, depending on how far out that cash is coming to us. Uh, so just trust me on the formulas with that one, but that's what's happening there. And essentially, if we add up all of these free cash flows from these 11 cash flow events, we get a present value for those cash flows, uh, and this is in billions of about 1.3, so that's about $1.3 trillion. And if we add back on the cash that Apple currently has on their books, we get to an intrinsic value of $1.4 trillion, assuming that you want to make a 10% return. Now, if we come back to Yahoo Finance and compare that to the current market cap of Apple, we find that the current market cap is actually also $1.4 trillion. So assuming that Apple can execute on their growth plans um, and assuming that you want a 10% return from this investment, then it looks like Apple is currently priced basically exactly at intrinsic value. If you wanted instead a 15% return, uh, we can plug that in as our discount rate, and that would show that you would have to buy Apple for closer to $1 trillion in order to get a 15% return.
Now, of course, as value investors, we avoid at all costs paying intrinsic value for anything. Uh, so at the current point in time, I am not a buyer of Apple. I'm someone that wants to buy Apple stock for substantially less than $1.4 trillion, ideally right around half of that. Or I'm someone that wants to use much more conservative assumptions, let's say 7% and 5% as our growth rates and pick it up for a price more like $1.1 trillion. So it gives us a nice margin of safety should the business not be able to execute on their, on their growth plans or should anything go wrong throughout the holding period for this investment. Now, please continue to stick around for the last part of this video because this is extremely important, uh, especially with companies like the one I'm about to show you. So I've just replaced all of these numbers with the numbers for the Ford Motor Company. So Ford has uh, an annual free cash flow in the last 12 months of around $10 billion. They currently have cash of $22 billion. And the Yahoo Finance growth rates actually look a bit more pessimistic than this. Uh, but just for today's example, I'm going to assume that uh, the Ford business stays stagnant over the next 10 years. So it doesn't shrink, it doesn't grow, it just continues to produce $10 billion uh, of free cash flow every single year. I've also dropped my uh, terminal value down to the low end of our range of 10 to 15, uh, just to represent that it's a slightly poorer quality business because it's not uh, you know, a growth machine like Apple. And you'll see that when we run this calculation, we end up with an intrinsic value of $122 billion. Now, when we compare that to the current market cap of Ford, which is only $31 billion, uh, all of a sudden, Ford looks extremely undervalued. Um, but unfortunately, one of the things that this style of discounted cash flow doesn't capture is that Ford has a massive amount of debt. So if we have a look at their balance sheet, although Ford has $22 billion in cash and it produces $10 billion in cash flow per year, it has a monstrous $156 billion in debt. So the question is, how do we account for this in our valuation? Uh, and the answer is that instead of looking at market cap and instead of worrying about adding in excess cash, we simplify the valuation method slightly and we use something called the enterprise value. Now the formula for the enterprise value of a company, which in this case for Ford is 166.2 billion, is essentially the market cap plus any debt and minus any cash. And what it's intended to represent is what is the market currently valuing the earnings engine of the business at. So forget that companies can have cash and forget that companies have debt. Just simply look at the fact that companies produce cash. Um, what is that cash flow alone worth before we adjust for debt or cash or anything like that? Uh, and that, in my opinion, is best represented by the enterprise value. So currently that's 166.2 billion. And if we come across to the second tab of my spreadsheet, so forgetting about cash and forgetting about debt, purely looking at the enterprise value and what is this cash engine worth, we come up with an intrinsic enterprise value in the second tab of the spreadsheet of right around $100 billion. Now let's compare the results that we've had from these two methods. So with the Pabri method of adding in excess cash and comparing that against the market cap, we get an intrinsic value in market cap terms of $122 billion compared to $31 billion. So this looks like a business trading for 25 cents on the dollar. It looks extremely, extremely cheap. But when we account for the debt by simply looking at enterprise value instead of market cap, we come up with a fair value of 100 billion uh, in enterprise value versus 166 billion, which is what Ford is currently trading at. So suddenly from using one method, we go from extremely undervalued to another method, we go to about 50% overvalued in my view. So um, it's very important if you're using these tools to invest in companies that have a large amount of debt, such as Ford, to make sure that you focus on enterprise value and account for that debt rather than looking at the market cap. Now, if we go back to Apple for a second and have a look at their enterprise value versus the market cap, the numbers are actually almost the same. And the reason for that is if we scroll down to the balance sheet for Apple, we'll see they've got debt, they've got 116 billion of debt, um, but they've also got 
just about the same amount in cash. So those two near enough cancel each other out. And for that reason, the market cap and the enterprise value are basically the same thing. If you can come across companies that have a bucket load of cash, uh, they're going to look much more attractive than companies that have a bucket load of debt. Uh, and that's what the focus on enterprise value is intended to account for. So I hope that helps you with your intrinsic value calculations into the future. If you've got any questions, certainly drop them in the comments below. Uh, hit like, hit subscribe on the video, and I hope you all have a great day. Cheers.